Hello everyone, welcome to today's service. Uh, my name is Chad Broom. I'm the pastor of the Trinity Bible Church and today's message is entitled How to Be Useful to God. And we're looking at the book of Nehemiah. It's part of our series and um, the series is entitled Major Themes of the Bible's Books. And so as we pull out the various themes, we discover um, some amazing insights um, it's more of a bird's eye view approach to looking at scripture right now. Um, often we go down deep into um, verse by verse and chapter by chapter. Um, but at the moment we're looking and pulling out some of the major themes that we see throughout scripture. And so today as we jump in there, I want to ask this question to you. Um, are you an armchair critic? <laughs> and I think you know exactly what that means. An armchair critic. You may be a sports armchair critic. Um, someone who's able to sit in your comfortable couch, watch a game of, of, of rugby or something on TV and be um, a, a prolific commentator on all the activities you know better than any of the referees. Um, you could play the game better than any of the um, uh, first class athletes out there playing the game sportsmen. Um, from the comfort of your couch, you are an armchair critic. But that goes to politics, that goes to religion, that goes to issues in this world, that goes to finances, that goes to just about anything. We can become armchair critics. And an armchair critic is someone who has a lot to say. They talk, but they don't walk. <laughs> they, they talk, but they don't do. They don't implement things. And so from, from a young age, we, we grow up with this idea. Um, so often we're trying to pretend we're better than we are. Um, and we're trying to give people information on how to do something. Yet we can't even actually do it ourselves. Or we've never done it ourselves. We don't even have the experience. But we're armchair critics. Well, the world needs people who talk the talk and walk the walk. In other words, the world needs people who do something about the problems they talk about. They are people who come up with a, with a solution and they implement a plan. They don't just talk about it. So we know what armchair critics are and maybe from time to time you are an armchair critic. As we look at this man Nehemiah and, and the book Nehemiah, we discover a man who talked the talk and walked the walk. He was a man who became useful to God because of it. He became useful to God and because he became useful to God, he became a blessing to the Israelites. Now it's worth opening up Nehemiah chapter 1 and 2. And, and I'd love for you to read that entire, um, those two chapters. I'm going to highlight some aspects of those two chapters now, not read the entire thing, but read through the whole chapter 1 and chapter 2 and you get the introduction. But I will read the first few verses because it sets the scene for what I want to share today about being useful to God. Nehemiah chapter 1. These are the memoirs of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. In late autumn, in the month of Kislev, in the twentieth year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was at the fortress of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came to visit me with some other men who had just arrived from Judah. I asked them about the Jews who had returned there from captivity and how things were going in Jerusalem. They said to me, things are not going well for those who returned to the province of Judah. They are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down. And the gates have been destroyed by fire. When I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. Then I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commands. I confess that I, sorry, I confess that we have sinned against you. Yes, even my own family and I have sinned. 
We have sinned terribly by not obeying the commands, decrees and regulations that you gave us through your servant Moses. Please remember what you told your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful to me, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, I will, listen carefully, if you return to me and obey my commands, sorry, and live by them. Now this is vital. If you return to me, obey my commands and live by them. Notice I've been talking about there are people who can talk the talk but not walk the walk. This is saying people, this is what God will honor. He will honor those who turn back, who repent and who walk with God. Look, look what it says again. If you are unfaithful to me, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands and live by them. That's the walking part. Then even if you are exiled to the ends of the earth, I will bring you back to the place I have chosen for my name to be honored. So this is an important passage. Okay, so those are the first few verses. Um, and really read through the rest. Um, there's a lot to the whole thing because then Nehemiah goes and approaches um, the king. And God gives Nehemiah favor in front of the king. In that moment, as he approaches the king, almost in fear because he's looking sad, and the king says to him, why are you so sad, Nehemiah? And Nehemiah says, why should I not be sad? Because the city where I come from, the, the walls are in ruin, the gates have burned down. And the king says, what can I do? So the door gets opened, and Nehemiah says, God, help me now. And then he presents the request, send me to go and repair my city's walls. And the king does that. He sends him. He sends him off with um, letters to allow him free passage through the countryside. He sends him with um, an armed um, escort. He sends him with um, letters to the forestry uh, chief so that he can get as much lumber as he needs to rebuild the wall. It's an amazing provision of God to have that favor um, that that the king shows him. So this is remarkable. Now, Nehemiah was not useful to God because he was a great man or because he had power or authority. One verse that I didn't read to you, but I want, I want to read it to you quickly. In, at the end of chapter 1, it says, In those days, I was the king's cup bearer. That's what Nehemiah was. He was the king's cup bearer. And so Nehemiah was not useful to God because he was a great man or because he had power and authority. We could say he was just a cupbearer. Even though a cupbearer was an officer of, of high rank in the Egyptian, Persian and Assyrian and Jewish monarchs, the cupbearer was important. Um, he was in charge of the king's wine and drinks and he was considered a highly trusted officer of the royal court. And, and, and his, one of his chief um, roles was to make sure the king remained safe because poisoning the king's drink would be one of the easiest ways to get rid of a king, one of the best forms of assassination. So he had a, a highly trusted position. However, Nehemiah the man is just a common man, but he's a common man in a unique position who spends a fair amount of time in the presence of the king. He was not an advisor to the king. He was not a man who, 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 who sat there and gave directions and instructed. He was not the general of the king's army. He was not the, the leader of the king's finances and the finance minister. He was not the one in charge of, of the welfare of the people. He was just the cupbearer. He served the king his drinks. Nothing majorly flashy about that. But he held influence in that position. Not power, not authority, but some influence. You see, if the king had decided, I'm done with Nehemiah, I don't need him as a cupbearer, I'd like somebody else. Well, then Nehemiah would have been a poor soul all on his own, living in captivity with nothing, no way of, of, of really um, making a living. 
So what then makes Nehemiah useful to God? Well, when we dig a little deeper and we read through the book of Nehemiah, and even in this opening passage that I've read, we see that Nehemiah was a man of character and persistent in prayer. He was a man of character and persistent in prayer. His, his starting point was prayer. He prayed. We discover as we read through the book, though, he's also a brilliant planner and organizer and a motivator. Under his leadership, the walls get rebuilt in 52 days. A remarkable feat. Then, after the walls are built, he led the nation to religious reform and spiritual awakening. As we read it, we discover that he was also calm under pressure, and his default go-to was to come before the Lord when troubles came his way. He was also bluntly honest with the people when they sinned, and he was prepared to be the man who points the finger. When we look at his life, we learn some lessons. First of all, we learn this lesson. Step one, pray. The first step in any venture, the first step when faced with trouble or persecution or problems of any kind, pray. Pray. Notice what it says when it, when, when it refers to him praying. It says that he prayed to the God of heaven. Sounds very similar to the way we are commanded by Jesus to pray in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so he made that the starting point for himself. Another lesson we learn with regards to Nehemiah is that people under God's direction can accomplish seemingly impossible tasks. And it's often for this distinction that people get labeled as great. Nehemiah can be labeled as a great man because a seemingly impossible task was completed and done under his leadership. And so he might get the pat on the back. He might be called great. But the truth is, God is great. And Nehemiah was just being obedient. So people under God's direction can accomplish impossible tasks. But it's God that's actually doing it. And there are two parts to being useful to God. Talking with Him and walking with Him. And that's already come out in this passage. Nehemiah immediately prayed. He talked with God. He wasn't just an armchair critic about the issues. He didn't just sit back and hear his brother's complaints about things that had gone that were going wrong in Jerusalem and sit back and go, oh, that's terrible. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. And that's all he would say. No, he got involved. He got, he got active. And that action started with him praying. And he cries out to God. And then later on we discover that he says, it's God who put the desire in my heart to rebuild the walls. This was God's doing. And so he was a man who talked with God and he walked with God. And this is who he was before he was thrust into this position of leadership. It's vital to see that. Now, with regards to the major themes that will help us understand what's going on in this book, one of the major themes is vision. God gives Nehemiah the vision to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. His heart aches. And essentially, his heart aches for what God heart, God's heart aches for. You see, the temple had been completed in, in 516 BC, but the city walls remained in ruins for another 70 years. And these walls represent power and protection, and they represent the beauty of Jerusalem. These walls would protect the temple, and, they, and, and these walls would help to ensure ongoing freedom of worship at the temple. And so God puts the desire to rebuild the walls in Nehemiah's heart. He gets the vision. It's not his vision. It's God's idea. It's God's plan. And he gives that vision to Nehemiah. He's basically saying, and this is essentially what I see a vision being. It's a vision is God is saying, yeah, Nehemiah, look, this is what I see. This is what I want. And he lets Nehemiah see that. And then what God wants becomes what Nehemiah wants. Because he's seen the vision. He gets it. He knows what's on God's heart. 
That's the vision, folks. And that's the vision you and I need in life. Not something we've clamored for. Not because we want to be great, so we've got a great vision. And we've dreamt up something great. No. This did not come from him sitting down and, and dreaming up a dream. So that he could become a great man. Or do something great for God even. Which sounds, you know, spiritually just right on track. Now, do something great for God. What great thing can I do for God? No didn't come that way it came through God stirring his heart and God said let me show you what you need to see and that's the vision that he clung to it came from God it was a God thing and folks when you cling to a God vision there's a greater chance of fulfilling that vision and, and fulfilling what God wants you to to fulfill with regards to that vision why because it's not yours it came from God because when things are going tough, you can say, God, you gave this to me. I need your help. And next, the next primary theme we see in this book is prayer. Now, both Nehemiah and Ezra, in, in, uh, we, we see are, are men of prayer. They respond to problems with prayer. Just look at Nehemiah's pattern of behavior. He recognizes the problem, immediately prays, and then he acts on the problem. That's why he's a man who talks and walks with God. Third of the of the uh, major themes is leadership, and and Nehemiah is thrust into leadership. Nehemiah demonstrates excellent leadership qualities. But the the thing you need to understand is that Nehemiah was spiritually ready to heed God's call. God had grown him, and he had spiritually matured. To the place where he was a man who walked and talked with God. And so he listened to God. He knew the heart of God. But he was humble. He was repentant as well. And so he was ready to take that role. Not because he was great. He was just the cupbearer after all. Not because he had done something remarkable. He just stepped up in the moment because he saw the vision which God gave him. And he said... Okay, Lord, I'll, I'll do it. And then he jumps in there and he plans and he, and he builds a team and he problem solves and, he, and courageously he gets things done. And he leads by example and he rolls up his sleeves. Then we look at another major theme and this is one that starts to help us discover something about the character of Nehemiah. This theme is called Problems. He faced scorn. He faced slander. He faced threats from the enemy. But he also encountered fear and conflict and discouragement from within, from his own ranks, from his own workers. So he understood problems and he never gave up. In fact, he always reverts to prayer when, with regards to these problems. And that's part of the lesson we learn from Nehemiah. But one thing I need you to understand is just because God gives a vision and God's got a plan for where we where he wants us to go and what he wants us to do does not mean that plan will not come without problems or opposition. Folks, the enemy does not sit idly by when Christians make inroads for Christ, when the gospel of Christ is proclaimed, when people are coming into the kingdom of God. The enemy is shaken by this and must act. And so he will confront and he will do whatever he can to discourage, to disrupt and to end any progress that Christians are making. That those being obedient to God, like Nehemiah, are doing. He never gave up. He persevered. This was a vision from God. That meant he trusted God and was saying, God, you've got this. This was your plan. I'm just your servant. So you're going to have to help us figure this out, God. And then the, the, the final major theme is repentance and revival. Even after the wall <coughs> excuse me. Even after the wall was rebuilt, we see that's not the end of the road for Nehemiah. He might have said, Ah, accomplish my task. I can go back now to the relative quiet of being the cup bearer. No, he, he leads the people back to um, 
repentance and to walking afresh with God, to come under God's word afresh, to rebuild their lives spiritually. He assists with that as Ezra had done as well. And so he leads the people in repentance and revival. Why? Because walls that are rebuilt are not enough. The physical outward things out there that we rebuild in our lives are not enough if we haven't rebuilt our lives on the inside. Folks, your life, what's going on inside your heart is what God's interested in. Who you are as a child of God, who you are as a human being on the inside, God is interested in that. And God wants to change us from the inside out. He wants to transform us, shape us, renew us. And He wants us to become pliable clay in God's hands, whom He can shape and mold into whom he wants us to be and what he wants us to be and what he wants us to do. And so he wants to shape your character first. He wants you to become godly. Men and women, he wants you to be godly. He doesn't want you to be great. He wants you to be godly. He can use godliness. When you become godly, you become useful in God's hands. And then the great God can do great things. Nehemiah was useful to God and did great things for God, no doubt about it. You see in Nehemiah chapter 6 verse 15 and 16, it says these wonderful words. After all sorts of challenges and setbacks, so on October the 2nd the wall was finished, just 52 days after we had begun. When our enemies and the surrounding nations heard about it, all these who had scoffed and ridiculed and, and, and sent opposition, they were frightened and humiliated. They realized this work had been done with the help of our God. Man, that's God getting the glory. God gets the glory. Nehemiah is not a great man. Did Nehemiah do great things for God because he was a great man? No. No. Did he do great things for God because he was a great leader? No. He did great things for God because he had at a long time ago before this had chosen to talk and walk with God. Because he talked and walked with God, he became burdened for the very things that were on God's heart. He loved what God loved and he hated what God hated. Remember his prayer. Humble at his own sin and his own family's sin. But at the same time appealing to God and to God's promises for Israel and for repentant sinners. And so Nehemiah became useful to God. Because he was godly, not because he was great. I'd encourage you to go look up a, a few passages of scripture. I'll highlight them for you now quickly. Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 4 to 11. I've read that to you already. But I want you to get this picture very clearly. He gets the bad news about the broken wall of Jerusalem. What does he do? He prays. You see, he recognizes um, God's holiness and he asks God for a hearing. He confesses sin and then he asks that God would give him favor with the king. What is he doing? He's preparing his heart before God and he's giving God room to work in his life. He's saying, Lord, I'm an open book. I need your help. But here's a problem. The walls of Jerusalem are down and he prays and he mourns in a sense. He fasts and prays. He, 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 he really, he's really broken before God because of the plight of the Israelites back in Jerusalem. And the city and the fact that it brought, um, he said that it, it, it brought this dishonor. It was a disgrace. That's the word that was used. Now look at chapter 2 verse 4. He has a conversation with the king. And during that conversation, the moment the king gives him um, a hearing, he, he immediately prays. I need your help now, God, is basically what he's saying. And then he leaves the outcomes to God. 
So we've had two incidences where he's faced with some sort of challenge and he prays. Now in Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 4 and 5, after being mocked and taunted by Tobiah and Sanballat, what does he do? He prays. He says, God, they're mocking you. You decide what to do with them. He expresses his frustration, maybe even his anger, towards what Tobiah and Sanballat are doing. And they're trying to disrupt the work of the rebuild, rebuilding of the wall. But he didn't take matters into his own hands. He was just ready and prepared. If we look at verse 9, a little bit further on of that same chapter, after the threats of attack by the enemy, he prays. But at the same time, he says to the men, put a sword in your belt, build a wall, but be ready for war, be ready to defend the city. He shows trust in God while also taking and implementing very practical steps. The men must be armed. They must be ready to fight. And so he prays, but he also behaves very practically. A man of action. Nehemiah chapter 13 verse 29. Reflecting on the actions of his enemy, what does he do? He prays. Lord, deal with their evil plans is what he's saying essentially. You deal with their plans. You've given me the vision to do the building. You deal with their plans. And he shows reliance on God. Because he's got a vision from God. Because he's got a task and a mandate from God. He now trusts God. Folks, Nehemiah was not a great man. Now, some of you might want to argue that point. Oh, look what he did. Look what he achieved. Nehemiah was not a great man. He was a godly man. And if there was the result of greatness because of his godliness, well, that's okay. That's wonderful. But Nehemiah would not have wanted anybody to write a memoir about him that says he was great. And when we read through this book of Nehemiah, these memoirs about him, what do we discover? We discover a great God, a good God, and we discover a godly man. He was first and foremost a man who talked with God and a man who walked with God. And this is what made him useful in God's hands. Today I want to ask you, are you spending time talking with God daily? Are you running to God first? When you're facing challenges and difficulties, is talking with God your primary um, activity in your life as you as you develop your relationship with God? And then do you implement what God's word says and you walk with him by doing what he tells you to do? You see, there's talking and there's walking. Are you just a talker and not an implementer? Nehemiah was a man who put God's plans into action. He did something about it. He wasn't an armchair critic. And that's what made him useful in God's hands. He didn't have a lot to tell people about all sorts of things. He just lived it. He just lived it. I want to say that because he spent time with God in prayer, going way back in his life, it wasn't just in this moment. You see, this is why it's so important to build these foundations, these, these principles of devotion and commitment. These daily spiritual habits are so important. He spent time with God in prayer. And as he did that, God was shaping his heart. Then when God required Nehemiah to do something for him, he was ready and he was willing and he obeyed. You've got to first be the man of God before you do the things of God. And when you are the man of God or the woman of God, then when God calls you to do things for him, then godly people step forward and do things for God. And God's great name is praised. And people look and say, God must have done that. They don't, they don't elevate the man. They elevate God. They recognize God did it. This is so important. Armchair critics, by the way, folks, are pretty useless. But men and women who talk and walk with God are very useful to God. So don't dream about doing great things for God. That's usually tainted with self-motives, selfish motives. Rather, 
make yourself useful to a great God by spending time with him, by talking and walking with your God. Let's pray. Father God, help us to grow in our relationship with you so that when you call upon us to act, we are ready and willing. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Go with God. Have a great week.